A. Philip Randolph, who had introduced him to his first Harlem audience, said, Garvey had succeeded in making the Negro the laughing stock of the world. W.B. Du Bois and A. Philip Randolph saw Garvey as a person who was engaged in a grand distraction. Garvey's emphasis on a program of African redemption, his pretensions to some kind of imperial posture as the provisional president of Africa, they thought of as either charlatanry or just pure buffoonery. Their complaints about him provide a legitimation for the government to move against Garvey. Because you can always say, you see his own people don't even want him. And if they don't want him, then there must be something wrong. Encouraged by growing black opposition, the US government stepped up surveillance of Garvey. Eight federal agencies were directed to report on his activities and J. Edgar Hoover resolved to deal with Garvey once and for all. They placed spies in the UNIA, they sabotaged Black Star Line, the engines sometimes of the ships were actually damaged by foreign matter being thrown into the fuel and so on. And there was every effort made to destroy the movement. However, that wasn't the only thing that actually destroyed Garvey. There were internal problems to the movement as well as these external forces. Garvey's own crews took the Black Star Line to the brink of disaster. One captain steered his vessel off course to visit his wife. Another had a nervous breakdown and tried to sink his own ship. Enraged at the chaos on board one ship, Garvey got into a fistfight with the captain and fired half the crew. But when it came to mismanagement, he had only himself to blame. Garvey looked for people who would be personally loyal to him. I think this is the only way we can explain the mismanagement and incompetence of the Black Star steamship line. The first treasurer of that line was a railroad clerk who had no experience in bookkeeping. What was important here, I think, was not an intellectual competence, but a loyalty to this charismatic leader. As things spun out of control, Garvey confided in Herbert Boulin, the owner of the Barry and Ross Doll Company. To Garvey, Boulin was one of a few real friends. To J. Edgar Hoover, he was Agent P-138. He got closer to Garvey than anyone else uh, working for the government. And Garvey was really isolated. Things weren't going well with the organization. The Black Star Line was losing money. And so remarkably, he confesses to this informant that he'd tried suicide, that he was thinking of suicide again. It shows the loneliness Garvey must have had at the top. You know, he couldn't reveal those sorts of things to to the key people around him. By 1921, the Black Star Line was on the verge of bankruptcy. But Garvey mailed brochures to his supporters, advertising stock in yet another ship. It would prove to be a major blunder. In the brochure is a picture of a ship which purports to have been the SS Phyllis Wheatley. It was a ship that Garvey was negotiating for and did not own. And it seems that someone etched into the bow of the ship the words, the SS Phyllis Wheatley. In other words, it was a misrepresentation. It gave the impression that Garvey and the Black Star Line owned this ship, when in fact there was no such ship. In January 1922, Garvey and three UNIA officers were arrested for federal mail fraud. The man Hoover once called a notorious Negro agitator was finally in his grasp. The mail fraud was the most convenient and ultimately the only 
uh, means that they could find to prosecute him. Uh, prosecution was not the end. Deportation was the government's real aim. In July 1922, while he was out on bail, Garvey made a move that would lead his black critics to question his sanity. He held a meeting with Edward Young Clark, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Garvey felt that the Ku Klux Klan represented the invisible government of the United States. That's the real source of um, power in America, Garvey believed. And Garvey felt that as provisional president of Africa, he was entitled to meet with the counterpart of white American power. And so Garvey didn't feel that he had done anything wrong. In fact, Garvey thought that what he had done was a diplomatic stroke of genius. After he met with the Klan leaders and had them speak at his rallies, he was viewed as an enemy of black people. For a so-called responsible black spokesman to be having anything to do with these people was viewed as a complete and utter betrayal. This was too much. In a letter to the Attorney General, eight prominent black critics said the UNIA was composed of the most primitive and ignorant element, Negro sharks and Negro fanatics. They called for Garvey's deportation, but Garvey fought back. When W.E.B. Du Bois called him the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race, Garvey said Du Bois was a rabid mulatto who needed a horsewhipping. A. Philip Randolph, who had once befriended Garvey, called the UNIA leader a half-wit, low-grade moron. In the midst of that, A. Philip Randolph received a package in the mail, and thinking it was a bomb, he called the police. They opened it up, and they found that it was the severed human hand of a white man, signed with an, a note signed by the KKK. Randolph believed that it was really the Garvey movement that had sent it. Garvey, now frequently accompanied by eight bodyguards, denied involvement and said he was the target of violence. But then Reverend James Eason, once Garvey's hand-picked second in command, and now expected to be a key prosecution witness, was shot and killed. Before he died, Eason identified his assailants as Garveyites. As Garvey's trial began on May 18, 1923, a police bomb squad stood on alert and UNIA members packed the courtroom. On the first day of the trial, Garvey fired his attorney and announced that he would defend himself. I think Garvey believed that his powers of rhetoric and oratory would ultimately sway the court in his favor. He would have ruled the court, in other words, by his superior oratorical gifts. And I think Garvey came, in the end, to rue that decision because it was a disaster. Garvey paced up and down before the jury box as a parade of former UNIA officials took the stand to testify against him. Defiant, Garvey blamed subordinates and evaded responsibility for his errors. He also took a lot of time badgering witnesses, alienating, I think, in the process, a lot of jurors uh, by his courtroom manner. He seemed to be intimidating of witnesses, even his own witnesses. It was not a, not a good performance by Garvey. 